Hello, friends. Patrick, uh, excuse me. Hello, friends. Uh, Patrick McFarlane here of the Liberty Weekly Podcast. This is episode 74, and I'm joined again by a great guest, Kyle Ancelone of Foreign Policy Focus. We're going to be talking a little uh, Iran and the Iran nuclear deal and Trump backing out of the Iran nuclear deal, and also talk a little bit about uh, Gina Haspel and uh, the torture. So <laughs> without further ado, just going to hand it over to Kyle. How's it going, buddy? Pretty good. I mean, well, you know, not everything around the world is good, but I'm doing well today. Uh, you know, at least I'm not living somewhere where there's bombs falling. Yeah, I, I try and tell myself that every day, just to try and be grateful. Um, but so we we've been talking for about what thirty minutes now already, and uh, there's the possibility that we will be joined mid show by Shaheen, another guest, uh, the Australian Iranian, so we can get his perspective hear what his parents have to say about the deal because they grew up and lived in Iran. Um, so hopefully he'll be joining us. But if not, uh, Kyle is a great guest in of himself. So Kyle, why don't, why don't we uh, just start from that bird's eye view that I was talking about before. And before we do that, this is episode 73 instead of 74. So libertyweekly.net forward slash 73. All right, buddy. So you want, you want to start from the beginning bird's eye view of Iran just as a country? Yeah, so I, I mean, I guess the easy, you know, let's just go back uh, at, in the 60s and 70s. There's a U.S. op puppet uh, that is the dictator of Iran, the Shah. In 1979, uh, some of the people of Iran finally have enough and rose up. Uh, the kind of an extremist government in a lot of ways, the Ayatollah and the Iranian Revolution happens. Uh, you know, this is a very right wing Shia government. Uh, even today, that now that there's been liberal, liberalization, there's still, you know, women uh, are technically supposed to wear head covers, even though I think the Tehran police don't enforce that all the time. Um, anyways, that Iranian government takes American hostage, hostages, which doesn't help to get the situation off to a really bad start. Uh, then the United States makes an important shift in the Middle East. Uh, we no longer are concerned primarily about Saddam Hussein. In fact, we take his side and let him start a war against the Iranians that rages through the 1980s and involves a couple cases of Iran, uh, or Iraq, excuse me, and Saddam Hussein using gas against the Iranians. Um, this, you know, kind of goes on uh, through the 1990s. Uh, there's not a war, but there's, you know, definitely tensions and hostilities there. Of course, in 91, you had Saddam Hussein invade Kuwait, and then the United States destroy a large part of Saddam's army, uh, which I'm sure was a huge benefit to the Iranians. Of course, in 2003, you have the, the next most critical step, which is the United States uh, taking out the Iraqi army and overthrowing Saddam Hussein. Yeah, and, and before we go any further, just a few notes about um, the Iraq-Iran war. And um, <clears throat> so we it turns out through that that, okay, so yes, in the 80s, we were arming Saddam Hussein and uh, supporting him against Iran. But then later on, it also comes out that um, Reagan is sending weapons to Iran. And doesn't it turn out that the Israelis were arming Iran as well during that conflict, Kyle? Yeah, I don't know like the complete story of Iran Contra, but this involved the Reagan administration selling weapons and missiles through Israel to the Iranians uh, during the 1980s, which of course, like a year it I was playing before, was a huge scandal because you know we were at least publicly supporting the Saddam side of the Iraq-Iran conflict. Yes, and and um, as I was reading in Andrew Basevich's book that I've talked about before, essentially. Um, there's most of the U.S. action during that 80s war was in the Persian Gulf, where we were shooting down Iranian cutters in the sea. But I think it it all capitalized, or the 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 end of the war was signified by the United States as accidentally shooting down a commercial Iranian airliner. And I just bring these things up because you know I can. No, these are really good details, uh, you know, about the 1980s policy. Um, one of the important things here you have, though, in Iran uh, leading up till 2003 is Iran did have something of not a nuclear weapons program, but it seems to be Iran was researching what it would take to develop nuclear weapons. Now, 
some people say that you know iran was looking if it was plausible for them to get a nuclear weapon some people are saying uh and have made the claim that iran was actually more concerned about saddam hussein getting a nuclear weapon and was just doing research to find out what the iraqi breakout capabilities would be and of course if you remember back to you know 2001 2002 what was every american afraid of saddam hussein getting a nuclear bomb and so it is absolutely baffling to me how you know we could have complete condemnation and can't even consider the possibility that the iranians would have been terrified that saddam was getting a nuclear bomb uh, back you know in, in the early 2000s and yet at the same time we launched an aggressive war because on on the false belief that or the i shouldn't even say false belief on the complete lie that saddam hussein had a nuclear weapon yeah so does that bring us to the to the modern day then do you want to talk about the deal yeah so i guess it's important to note that uh u.s intelligence and the iaea which is the international watchdog group that monitors uh nuclear energy programs as well as nuclear weapons programs uh through both the non-proliferation treaty and the jcpoa which is a joint comprehensive plan of action or the iran nuclear agreement uh, and is tasked with you know monitoring these deals and make sure everybody is following through. Um, so they assess that Iran has not had any kind of nuclear uh, weapons program post 2003. They've only had a nuclear energy program and have not been in any way in violation of the safeguards or any of the measures of the MPT. Okay, and so I've I've followed the Iran nuclear deal. Um, I'm not super knowledgeable about it, hence you know why you're on Kyle. But um, so I, I have heard that Gareth Porter's come on to talk about it with Scott Horton uh, quite a few times, and Gareth Porter's written that great book, which um, what is the manufactured crisis? Yes, and one thing that I've always heard is okay, there's you know there the inspections and all that, but. Iran poured concrete into their nuclear reactors, right? When did that happen? Okay, so you have, uh, you know, under uh, like starting in 2014, you have oh, the Obama administration within uh, negotiations for the Iran nuclear agreement. Uh, the agreement is finally signed in 2015. I'm not quite sure exactly the day that Congress actually approved it. I, I remember, I don't know if you remember back to 2015, but there's a lot of debate and a lot of, uh, you know, false statements about the Iran nuclear deal being made. But essentially what the deal said is that not only would Iran remain in the non-proliferation treaty, which has inspections and safeguards to make sure that Iran doesn't develop a nuclear weapon, but would put additional protocols on their civilian nuclear energy program in exchange for sanctions relief uh, from money from the West. And so on top of not only, uh, you know, just saying that we're going to allow the IAEA to have cameras in our nuclear weapons facilities and in, inspect those facilities 24-7, uh, we are also going to uh, destroy our heavy water reactor. Now, the important difference between a heavy water and a light water nuclear reactor is a heavy water reactor produces uh, heavy water, which is much more easier to spin down with centrifuges and enrich that uranium to a level needed to make a nuclear bomb if that was something that you were doing. Now, you could also use that uranium as nuclear fuel, and there's, you know, dual purpose. There's dual purpose uh, with, you know, it could be used in a weapons program and an energy program uh, for a lot of these things. Uh, Iran also had a lot of centrifuges that they were using to spin down this fuel. I think they were even selling it. Uh, they were actually exporting their enriched uranium. However, they also agreed to destroy a large portion of their centrifuges, further making them, you know, moving them, it would make take them a lot more time to make a nuclear bomb should, should they ever choose to uh, with, with these developments, destroying their heavy water reactor and a lot of their centrifuges. Uh, they also exported and agreed to cap the amount of enriched uranium the country held i think they had supported and got you know agreed to a cap that was something like uh only five percent of what they originally had so they got rid of 95 percent of the, their uranium supplies and then so is it true that in order to inspect um the nuclear sites all that the united states would do would have to get um approval from their closest allies is that can you talk a little bit about that well not their nuclear sites 
uh, oh. what the IA or what the JCPOA allows is that the United States or the IAEA would be able to inspect any site in Iran, including their military facilities, if a country was able to provide evidence that there was some kind of activity going on there. And then I think, uh, you know, Iran would have a chance to refute. But in the end, if a majority of the signatories to the Iran nuclear agreement, uh, which would be uh, Russia, China, Germany, UK, France, and the United States agreed that, yeah, Iran is in violation or, or there's evidence that Iran may be in violation. We need to check this out. Uh, these uh, only a majority. So the UK, France, Germany, and the United States would have to agree that, yeah, uh, we think Iran is in violation. And then the IEA would go and spec. And so, you know, Donald Trump in his speech said that, you know, the Iran nuclear deal didn't allow unqualified access to all of Iran's military sites. And basically what he's suggesting is that uh, the IAEA should be able to go anywhere they want in Iran at any time without any notice. And obviously no country will allow that. That's completely absurd. And so what the Iranians negotiated was is that if you know you have a legitimate concern, you could come in and inspect the sites, but you have to convince at least your allies that the evidence is correct. It can't just be uh, the you know Netanyahu said, "Oh, Mossad knows that there's a, a nuclear site at Iran's secret military base, so now the IEA gets to go in and look around." Uh, you know, you have, at least have to convince France and Germany. How do you think that Americans would feel in in the shoes of the Iranians, or how do you think the American government would feel if the tables were turned? You know, yeah. Well, and, and the most amazing thing about it is that from 2003 to 2015, there's no evidence, no intelligence assessment, or you know, intelligent community believes that other than Mossad. I mean, U.S. intelligence, they don't believe that Iran is working or has any aspirations to get a nuclear weapon. And so throughout all this time, we have sanctions on the country. And then we say that, hey, you got to des destroy a large portion of your civilian energy uh, program. Uh, you know, that I'm sure is very important to Iran. You know, they have 80 million people. It's not, I mean, it's not a poor, poor country, but, you know, they need energy in it. There's parts that are in the desert. So I'm sure air conditioning would be nice. So cheap energy is probably huge there. And, uh, you know, they agreed to destroy all that just so they could trade with the Western countries. Uh, oh, and then I guess we should address the cash because this is Donald Trump's favorite thing. He goes, and they got all the cash. Yeah. I don't do a good Donald Trump. Anyways, basically what he talks about is that the Americans loaded up some planes with uh, hundreds of billions of dollars and gave it to Iran. So that's not really what happened. So back uh, as we were discussing first, the U.S. was allies with Iran in the 1960s and 1970s. And in fact, the Iranian Air Force is still made up mostly of F-14 Tomcats sold to them by the United States. So we have planned weapons contracts uh, with the Iranians. However, the Iranian Revolution happened. And so then the United States said, well, the Iranians are our enemies, so we're not going to sell them the weapons. I'm sure that, I mean, that makes enough sense. But then they also said we're not going to give them the money back either because the Iranians have made some payments up front. And it's like, well, yeah, you really can't do that. You're kind of stealing the money for the, from the uh, Iranian government there, who, of course, has stolen from the Iranian people. We're all libertarians and know that. But come on here. We're dealing with states and trying to understand this in the big picture. And so then the international courts who are tasked with arbitrating and ruling on these issues said that, yeah, the United States has to give that money back to Iran. And so as part of the nuclear agreement, what the United States agreed to do was to give the money back to Iran that we had stolen from them in the first place. I mean, this is a, the kind of agreement that had Donald Trump negotiated, he would be talking about right now. It's the greatest deal in the history of the world. It absolutely 100% made sure that if the Iranians are developing nuclear weapons, the United States will have plenty of uh, warning that it was going on uh there's an international and a system set up to make sure that this is done publicly and uh you know could really bring the whole international community together sanctions would snap back on if iran was in any way a violation of the deal and iran's been in compliance with the deal the whole time that's why donald trump uh, initially wasn't able to withdraw from it isn't because obama was covering up that the iranians were cheating it's because the iranians weren't cheating on the deal 
great. And, and, I, and I think that brings us to what was it yesterday? Yeah, I think it was yesterday that he uh, took us out of the deal. So you had a, dra- a great, terrific episode that I'll link in the show notes page here. Uh, your most recent episode about this, where you really go deep and dissect, um, you know, Donald Trump's speech and his statements. And you've been doing that thing with the audio clips that I really enjoy, too. Um, so why, why don't you take us into that? Yeah, well, thanks so much. That's episode uh, 191 of Foreign Policy Focus, if you want to check that out. And like Pat said, I get really into the weeds of it and go through most of Trump's speech. But anyways, what Trump decided to do was he said that because of the evidence that the Israelis presented saying that Iran, which is really strange. First of all, it's really strange because what the Israeli evidence was is that Iran had that nuclear weapons program prior to 2003 that was exploratory. That's what the Israeli evidence showed. Everybody already knew that. And so the Israelis claimed that Iran was in violation of the deal. Doesn't really make sense. And then apparently Trump bought it, which I thought was kind of strange because prior to Netanyahu giving that evidence, Trump's line has always been Iran was in violation of the spirit of the deal and the deal wasn't in the national interest or national security interests of the United States of America. And that's why we had to withdraw. However, national, I don't believe Trump's a national security interest one time during that single thing. And he only cited the Netanyahu evidence as, you know, a direct reason as to why we need to leave the deal. So the evidence that Israel provided wasn't new at all. It shouldn't have provided a reason for Donald Trump to leave the deal. Iran is definitely not in any violation of the nuclear agreement. However, Everybody just kind of assumes that, well, the Persians like making nuclear weapons, apparently. And we all know that they're always just trying to do it in secret. And eh, they're probably in violation. And also, I think there's a a great sense that people really don't understand what's going on here. And they hear a lot of people saying that Iran is definitely violating the deal. And a lot of people saying that Iran is in no way violating the deal. I think it's fair they'll split the difference. So like, yeah, they're probably kind of right. They're probably kind of right. And when we figure Iran's violating the deal a little bit maybe it's more of a technicality kind of thing but they're definitely doing something wrong you know because at the end of the day everybody assumes that the goal of the iranians is to get a nuclear weapon and it's just simply not the case and um obviously uh john bolt you know john bolton uh comes in it, so it's it's not really a surprise that we're getting out of the nuclear agreement i mean last month i saw zero hedge was reporting that donald trump would bring us out of the agreement this this month and um, so, so one one thing that I did notice at the end of of Trump's speech was that he was appealing to the Iranian people, and it's I mean it just sounds like classic regime change rhetoric, you know. Yeah, I talked about this a little bit in my episode, and uh, yeah, he says I have a message to the Iranian people that your government's ripping you off, and that the Americans are here to help you. Well, first of all, the thing he said right before that was a threat to Iran, saying that if Iran threatened the United States in every way, they would face something that's never been faced before in history. Basically meaning that the United States is going to bomb Iran heavily is is more or less what Trump was saying and waged a regime change there, which is going to kill millions of people, right? I, I mean, at best, I, I would say, uh, but you know, maybe you get more concerned at, fine, hundreds of thousands, right? Um Yeah. And then at the next time he says, we care about you and we want to help you. And so what we're going to do is we're going to deprive your country of all American imports. We're going to try to keep the rest of the world from trading with you. That way you're poor and you starve. And that's going to make you be able to somehow rise up against your government and overthrow it. Yeah. Well, I mean, we've seen this play out over and over again, Kyle. It's just so frustrating. (laughs) Well, right. It's amazing that you have Iraq right next door to Iran with, you know, somewhat similar issues in the two countries. I mean, Iran does have a uh, somewhat large uh, uh, Sunni minority population. Uh, They have a Kurdish population with, uh, you know, some autonomy. Uh, You know, of course, you have a strict government in the central of Iran. And so I can't see how it would you know, really end up any different other than the fact that the Iranians have a much more advanced military than uh, Saddam did at the time the United States invaded in 2003. Of course, you know, as we talked about before a lot, that was because of the 1991 war against Saddam. Yes. And so I think uh, we should maybe move on to the second half here. Did you have anything, any closing remarks about the 
Iran deal before we get into Gina Haspel? Well, I, I guess a couple things. Um, one would be is that a lot of people are saying, well, I, I guess there's a lot to be left det determined to say the least. Iran could remain in the deal with the other senators to the agreement. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what Trump does and how he reacts to Germany, France, and the UK, who could make real benefits by trading with the Iranian people. Uh, there's a lot of wealth there, uh, you know, that, and there's a lot of energy in Iran. And there's 80 million people. So that's a good market for these countries to reach out to. And it would you know, be a real shame if you know, the, the people of Europe and the people of Iran can't get more wealthy together by trading. Uh, but I'm guessing Donald Trump is going to look to prevent this. One of the big issues here is that Iran has been unable to purchase uh, civilian passenger airplanes for quite a long time. And their fleet, their air fleet is really old and they deal with uh, crashes on a somewhat frequent basis. And so Boeing and Airbus were going to make huge profits selling planes to Iran, and they're now unable to do so. I think the Trump administration actually announced today that they would only have the next 90 days uh, to you know carry out the deals, and then all trade is going to be shut off. Now, Airbus will be a little bit more because it's more of a European and international country uh, to see how much the United States could actually prevent that. Uh, however, you know, we could now be possibly, you know, engaging in some trade wars with our, you know, ally countries in Europe over, you know, trying to get them to enforce sanctions on Iran. I don't think it will get that far. I can't imagine that it would get that far, but you never know with the Trump administration. Yeah, I, I heard um, Ron Paul talking about this today with Daniel McAdams about Boeing specifically. And I think. Ron Paul said it was it was pretty ironic because he couldn't think of a company that was closer to the deep state than Boeing. <laughs> right. Well, I, I think that's one of the really interesting things that are yet to play out here is that there are a lot of uh, big money interests uh, that, that could do deals with Iran and make major profits. And so it'll be interesting if companies like Boeing are going to get some kind of carve out here. In one sense, you would think that they would just because of the deep state ties and the fact that Boeing uh, spends a lot of money in Congress to make sure that they're able to get these contracts. But in the other sense, you know, this is kind of, I guess, what you would expect from Donald Trump, who isn't necessarily a politician, and that is kind of ham handed and is just going to slam down his fist and say, Iran deal is done and, you know, not allow any of these carve out to, to happen. Yeah, it's just, it's so, I'm, I got really mad, to be honest, I got really mad when I watched the announcement. I was at work yesterday. <laughs> and like like I said, it, I mean, it was no surprise, but it's just so Orwellian to see presidents get up there and just spout, you know, neocon talking points. And I'm sure you can relate, <laughs> you know. Yeah, no, it, it's absolutely infuriating. I mean, there were some things in the speech that were an outright lie. Um, the, the fact that the Taliban are the Iran is a leading state sponsor of terror and they bat their enemies in Al Qaeda. Yeah, right. Iran, you know, Trump complained about all the money Iran was spending overseas. This money was being spent in Iraq and Syria to fight against Al Qaeda and ISIS, not fight for Al Qaeda, not fight for ISIS. The Taliban in Afghanistan, their postures are Sunnis. They're not friends of the Iranians. And I guess, you know, the, the two countries probably are able to, well, the, the you know, the, with the postures being a significant portion of Afghanistan, you know, prior to 2001, having some central control in the country. Yeah, they, they did, I'm sure, have some agreements and uh, ties. But the Taliban, you know, assassinated I, Iranian diplomats and was a real problem for Iran. Um and then, yeah, he said they had a missile program. Uh, Iran's missiles, uh, ballistic missiles, are capped at 200 or 2,000 kilometers now, which does give them the ability to strike Israel. But is, Israel is a nuclear power with a nuclear triad. They have nuclear capable bombers, they have nuclear capable submarines, and they have their nuclear capable land based Jericho missiles. And so let's you know, be honest here on, on who has uh, the, the military might Saudi Arabia, the UAE, who both have uh, US bought uh, militaries that were sold to them. Uh, you know, they have Patriot missiles. Uh, they have F-16s. Uh, they, you know, they have American-made tanks. Uh, they have American advisors. Israel with their nuclear arsenal and also American-made military uh, versus Iran, who th the threat you could come up with is they have speedboats that harass American ships and they have missiles that are too small to 
uh, have a, a nuclear warhead, even if Iran were to pursue a nuclear bomb. And then they also conflate their ballistic missile program with their space program because Iran does have a program where they launch satellites into space. And again, this is civilian. And uh, you can't really, uh, for rocket science reasons that I don't quite understand, you can't really just take a uh, rocket program where you're launching satellites and turn it into a program where you're going to be launching ICBMs with nuclear missiles. Uh, just just to touch on, so when when Trump told these pretty much outli- outright lies about, um, you know, uh, Iran support for Al Qaeda and stuff like that, um, weren't you saying in your episode that that might infer that it would fall under the AUMF if we attacked them? It, it could definitely do. I, I'm. I hope I made that point because it's a smart one. But maybe you just thought it up yourself. I, oh. Yeah. I, <laughs> I know, like, there is, I, I believe, a portion that AUMF said that says, at least in the Senate version, uh, that says that the United States wouldn't be able to just label a sovereign country. However, the more I think about it, if you have a case where, let's say, the United States labels the IRGC, which is uh, the Iranian uh, Revolution Military Corps, there as a state, uh, as a sponsor of terror, and then we have military operations against them. Well, then the rest of the Ira- Iranian army attacks the United States military invading their country. And then the United States, and Trump kind of says, shrug, well, I'm commander in chief. Our troops are being attacked on a mission that's approved by Congress. And so now I can respond to the whole threat. Okay, yeah. Uh, I, I think, you know, it, it takes a step, but let's be honest, you know, the leaps of logic that the American war state have used are far greater than this one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that that situation that you described, I mean, just sounds like Afghanistan, you know, where we jump in to defeat Al Qaeda, you know, those who ostensibly did 9-11 and then all of a sudden we're at war with the Taliban and we have to overthrow them, too. Yeah, that's actually a pretty good analogy there, Pat. But but they but um, didn't the AUMF include fighting the Taliban just outright, though? Well, I, I guess it did. But at the same time, uh, when the AUMF was passed, and I, I think to my knowledge, we, we me and Pat were talking about this a little bit in the preview to the show, but we were kind of talking about how the, the situation in Afghanistan was portrayed. I, ne- I never thought that the Taliban was the Afghan government. I just thought that they were a group that liked Al Qaeda and lived in Afghanistan. And so... I guess because I don't and to a lesser extent, I, Afghanistan was built wasn't necessarily called regime change like what happened in I, Iraq. It was more called a nation building that we we're you know Iran was kind of or Afghanistan was like a sandbox. You know we are taking a desert and forming it into a metropolis where I, Iraq we had wrecked the place first. Okay, yeah, and that that is that is an important distinction too. But yeah, just just learning about. I I didn't want to misconstrue what you just said, but the Taliban itself was a government, wasn't it? It was a kind of government. Yeah, I think they had consolidated central rule in most of Afghanistan prior to 2001. Uh, You know, they're only a plurality of the population. They're the most significant group, like 40 to 45 percent of the population. However, there's a lot of minority groups who don't want to live under Taliban rule because their beliefs and their way of life you can't have under Taliban rule. So it makes sense that they oppose them. But I think uh, at about the time of 2001, uh, the Taliban controlled most, if not all of uh, Afghanistan and were the, you know, kind of the central government power there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay. Well, we should move on to the next segment here. I know we have a lot to say about uh, Gina Haspel, but before I get into that, I'm going to do a little plug here. And um, this is for donor C and this is a great charitable application that uh, Tom Woods had on his show, and that's how I found out about it. And so they're having a resurgence in their program where you can buy some stock in the company or futures or something like that just to help them expand their operations. And so I, they have these little uh, specific individual projects that are sponsored by charity workers. And I, I decided yesterday that I would give to a different project that got fully funded, was um, helping set up capital for a charcoal business for a woman in Tanzania. But here's a project, and I think going on forward, I'm going to have an ad spot for specific projects on Donor C. And I'd love to see some of my listeners get involved with Donor C. Um, here's a project that I'm picking today uh, from South Sudan. 
You can see it on the screen here. Um, Nancy Eden is a 19 year old single mother in South Sudan, has two children. Um, she was pregnant. Now she's struggling to take care of her two children. Um, the aid worker wants $200 to help her buy basic things for her children and to put the rest of the money into a tea business so she can support herself. So I think this is great. I would, uh, I'll include a link to this project in the show notes page. And I'd love to see Liberty Weekly listeners get involved with this. Um, here are some comments. If you do it, leave a comment and then I'll include you in the next show. I think that's great. So um, looking forward to working with Donor C. I think it's a great thing to do. So yeah, can I just outline real quick though yeah. for your listeners to have some context here? South Sudan is a country that's plagued by civil war. I mean, as soon as South Sudan broke away from Sudan, uh, which was organized by the Hillary Clinton State Department uh, and definitely benefited oil interests, basically what happened is is I think they tried like break off the warring sets from Sudan from South Sudan, which then created another situation where there was a minority a majority group with power and a minority group and eventually that broke into a civil war and that civil war i mean is causing a famine in that country uh, there's no need right now to have a, a famine in south sudan however the war is so brutal uh what basically happens is you have an army march into a village kill everyone and then the people from that you know group now want to march into a village of the, the other group and kill all those people and it, it's just an absolute disaster and uh, the the only people that benefit are, of course, uh, you know, the the donors, well, the U.S. politicians who get the donations and then the U.S. companies that make the money. Well, shit, I'm so glad that I had you on, Kyle. So that's I mean, that's another interesting tidbit about this. And yeah, I'll, I'll shoot you an article bro, uh, uh, from the AP that ran just a few days ago. It doesn't go into all that detail, but it talks a little bit just about like how people there's I think close to seven million people now that are on the verge of starvation and, you know, just like imagine you know it, it's one thing to be on not have access to a lot of food and be like a young man okay that's something that maybe you can imagine but if you're a five-year-old kid and you know god forbid then your parents were also killed by the violence i mean you're likely going to start death but also they profile this older gentleman who's like 65 years old uh, what chance does he have you know he's probably gonna starve to death too yeah and i i'm very glad that donor c exists and uh, it's cool because, okay, the thing about Donor C is that they send you video here. Um, I'm going to screen share again. Um, the cool thing about it is that they send you videos so you can see where your money is going, exactly where it's going, as opposed to donating to the Red Cross or other organizations where you're completely detached from the giving process. Right. Yeah. I would I would guess that uh, this two hundred and twenty dollars that donor C will give to this family is probably more uh, than the Clinton Foundation will give to this uh, to South Sudan. So I would definitely you know take the opportunity. I, I really like donor C as well. Yeah, they're awesome. And uh, it'd be it'd be cool to talk talk with someone from there. But uh, so, yeah. And um, man, I can't. So Gina Haspel. <laughs> right. Going from some good in the world to some really evil in the world. Yeah, so, so why don't you outline it, Kyle? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll just up. The firing of Rex Tillerson created a chain reaction where Mike Pompeo got nominated and then confirmed to be Secretary of State. Uh, still mad at Rand Paul for that one. And then that led to vacancy as CIA director, which a CIA deputy director that Gina Haspel is now looking to fill. She does have to still be confirmed by the Senate, so hopefully we can prevent this from happening. Uh, Gina Haspel is a career CIA operative. At one point, she ran a CIA black site in 2002 in Thailand. Uh, this was misreported as first, as I guess, suggests that she ran that site the whole time. Uh, she ran it in October and November or in possibly into December of 2000 and true when wa waterboarding and torture definitely occurred at that site. Later on, I believe in 2006, she had gotten some promotions and was acting as, I believe, Jose Rodriguez's chief of staff. Uh, but she basically had some kind of high ranking role in the CIA and then helped to carry out the destruction of the videotapes that showed the torture at that CIA blood site. This was evidence that not only her, but other people in the CIA oversaw the torture uh, and waterboarding, which is, you know, simulated drowning where at the very last second they bring you back uh, from the verge of death. And uh, what's it? Is it man cow? If any, is, do I have that guy right? Uh, there's this guy who um, 
under you know was a big into saying that that wasn't torture that wasn't torture big conservative guy and uh underwent it in like 10 seconds in he was like oh my god that's torture and so um you know she oversaw this very uh disturbing practice and then helped to cover it up at no point did she make any attempt to expose this to the american people like the heroic John Kariaku did when he found out. And then John Kariaku went to serve time in prison for exposing the torture program. While she, who helped to carry out the program, Jose Rodriguez, who was running the CIA, uh, you know, John Yu, who drafted the memos that uh, gave the legal justification for it, Dick Cheney, George Bush, and all the other people involved went absolutely free. That man went to jail for saying something about it. And so we have um from from the hearing did this happen today i think today right yeah it was just going on before we went live yeah you want to talk about that yeah so actually i wasn't watching the hearing i had just got home from work and i was scrolling through twitter and there's a a guy ray mcgovern who is i believe the co-founder but was definitely an early member of veteran intelligence professionals for sandy and basically this was retired uh, intelligence officers, or even I think some high ranking military personnel, uh, Scott Ritter was a weapons investigator who all got together and formed this organization where basically they just, you know, issue memos and statements saying that this is an assessment because they believed uh, that the intelligence community had become corrupted and was just producing reports that reflected what the administration wanted to hear and not the truth. And so, you know, 2001, 2002, when they're making up lies about Saddam Hussein having uh, connections with Al Qaeda and that he was going to make a nuclear weapon and give it to the terrorists. These were uh, the people making common sense. Uh, now, one of these men is Ray McGovern, who is a 27 year veteran of the CIA and a 75 year old guy. He shows up to the committee hearing and says, Gina Haspel is a torturer. We cannot confirm her. And he is doing everything in his power to make any little stand to convince people that this woman is in no fit way to run the CIA. And uh, the the new the Capitol Police strike him out pretty brutally. And uh, I think you have a video here. Yeah, you can hear a big you can hear his head thump as they bring him out at the end. This is a 16 second clip that I'm going to play, and I hope it plays nice with my audio recording and it's not too loud for you. But here it goes. Sherry in Thailand. Stop resisting. Stop resisting. It's on the record. Stop resisting. Right there, that thump. Yeah, so some pretty rough stuff there. Right. And the, what he says that you could hear very clearly is this. So this is on the record. I'm not saying something that I read on Alice Jones's Infowar site. You know what I mean? This, this, everybody knows this. This, this isn't secret. Gina Haspel was involved in the torture program. This came up when she was initially promoted to deputy uh, secretary of the CIA. And I think at, our deputy director of the CIA. And I think at one point in the past, this had actually kind of stood in the way of, of her getting some promotions. Uh, but apparently she's just a, a violent and very dangerous woman. John Kariaku said that her nickname was Bloody Gina and, uh, you know, a real threat to the liberty, not only of the people of the United States, but probably more importantly, the people of the world and the Middle East, especially. Yeah. And we, we have that. There's an article on antiwar.com that really highlights uh, Ray, it's written by Ray McGovern. <laughs> so um, I'm going to bring that up. You just want to did you get a chance to read it, Kyle? I actually did. It's, in, it's on tab in my uh, browser too here. Oh, yeah. So we'll include a link to that in the show notes page as well, just so you can get his stake on it. You can hear it or you can see it now on the screen for everyone watching the video version, which you should be at libertyweekly.net forward slash 73. So, and I could also shoot you a link. There was a letter issued by 82 or 84 former uh, generals and admirals, you know, high ranking people in the military who had absolutely said that this woman is no way qualified to be uh, director of the CIA. Yeah. So things just continue to get a little darker and darker. And right, keep having me on the show. <laughs> yeah, right. And so I, it's kind of become now Kyle coming on the show is what uh, a bi monthly special or no, it would be bi weekly. So once every two weeks or so, right? Yeah, sounds good enough. I really like coming on your show. So anytime you send me an invite, I'm always like, oh, yeah, for sure, Pat. Hell yeah. Yeah. So um, 
just as we're closing up then, I guess, what, what do you think, how, how dangerous is this for, for war? I mean, what are, yeah, <laughs> Sorry. my words escape me. Well, Has I, I would say that, you know, just Haspel getting co confirmed as a danger in itself. I mean, we had Nikki Haley today saying that the United States is going to increasingly isolate Venezuela until Maduro is overthrown there. And so, you know, now we're looking to carry out a Middle East style regime change in South Africa, or South America, excuse me, that seems really dangerous to me. Um, so, you know, maybe CIA involvement would be there. Uh, of course, Iran. As far as it goes, I think a lot of it is going to depend if the European countries are going to be able to keep Iran within the nuclear agreement. If that happens, I think things could go on all right. If not, it could, you know, we, we could see things could spiral. Uh, maybe not. I mean, there wasn't an agreement in 2014. There wasn't war with Iran, I suppose. Uh, but it does seem that, you know, this is one of those situations where we're definitely moving in the wrong direction away from peace. Yeah. And and as uh, non-interventionists, we continually hope for peace and against war. Um, before Before we went on, there was about 30 minutes of conversation between me and Kyle. We talked about how libertarians should feel about veterans um uh support pat or my patreon page and you could get yeah. that awesome content yeah yes okay so um in addition to that let's see um oh we were talking just quickly here we were talking about generation kill uh which is a, a show that's like band of brothers that's about iraq war ii and i would recommend that everyone listen to it or watch it it's on Amazon Instant Video, it's really great. It's an HBO special. But also there is this, um, we were talking about the Iran, Iraq-Iran war. And uh, I watched this movie on Netflix called Under the Shadow. And it's a horror film, but it is about the Iraq-Iran conflict and a Tehran woman who stays um, in her home during the Iraq war my cat is getting at me here. He stays, she stays in her home during the war, during the invasion and uh, it's in Tehran and it's just her um, experience there. And I thought it was really insightful because as Americans, we just think that these people are living in caves in sand in, you know, and we don't realize that, you know, these people had kind of a Western experience. Oh yeah. Uh, very important. It's very humanizing. So I would suggest everyone watch the show under the shadow. And um, so too bad we couldn't get uh, Shaheen to join us for this episode because I think he could have brought a lot to the table, but maybe I'll have him on again to talk about this in the very near future. So uh, thanks so much, Kyle, for joining me. I'll include all the links of everything we discussed in the show notes page, but uh, thanks for bearing with me through that end segment too. <laughs> uh, no problem, Pat. I love coming on the show. Thanks so much for having me on. All right, buddy. Till next time.